We see very, very little evidence of global warming on a global scale. We see a little bit of warming possibly in the Northern Hemisphere and a little bit of cooling in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's very, very difficult to reconcile what we measure up in space and from balloons with thermometers. So we've got a problem. We really can't, as scientists, trust temperature measurements. But what people have done is start to model what our effects of global warming might be. And the upper diagram is showing us the model that we get... Uh, sorry, the upper diagram is showing us the model that we get from measurements. The lower diagram is a computer model. Now, there's absolutely no relationship between the two of them. So what we measure and what we model are two different things. For example, we have 23 IPCC computer models. Not one of them predicted that we were coming into a period of cooling and we've been cooling since 2003. Not one model was correct. And I'm not surprised when I look at diagrams like this. So it's very hard to deal with modelled data. These are four different models for the scenarios of what's going to happen with global warming. These are models telling us of how the tropical upper atmosphere will be. And they're all saying that above the tropics, with our current global warming, human-induced global warming, we must be getting warming. They're the models, and this is the data from measurement. So there's absolutely no relationship between trying to model a very complex system like temperature with what we can actually measure. The models do not fit in with what we observe. So, we can look at our temperature measurements in the 20th century. And we can see that there was a period of cooling from 1940 to 1975. Then another period of warming, and then we are now back into a period of cooling. This is generally reconciled by saying, well, look, we had a lot of CO2 and dust put out in the Second World War and the Industrial Revolution, and this put a lot of dust in the atmosphere and we started to cool. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't fit in with any of the other data. So it looks as if we've got fluctuating temperatures on the scale of our lifetime. And we can see this. We can look at carbon dioxide, which has been increasing. We can look at the temperature, and we can look at what happens from the sun. Now, this has got to be absolutely surprising to learn that that great body of heat up there is actually heating the planet. Well, what a surprise. And we have a very close correlation between solar activity and temperature, but no correlation with increasing carbon dioxide. Since 1975, when there was a change in the sun, we've had a, a correlation, but since 2003, we haven't had a correlation. So it doesn't look as if temperature is related to CO2. Now, the sun pumps out particles which blow away cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation hits the atmosphere and forms new chemicals. And so when you look at this black line, this is telling us the new carbon, the carbon-14 that formed in the atmosphere. And it's telling us that cosmic radiation varies, and it varies enormously. And what the cosmic radiation does is it gives us a window into where we are in space and how active the sun is. And we can start to then look at cosmic radiation on a different scale and plot that against when it was cool. And we had low cosmic radiation in very, very cold... Uh, sorry, we had high cosmic radiation in periods when it was very, very cold. The Dalton, especially the Maunder, Spur, Wolf and the Earth Minima. So there's something going on with our sun. The sun is variable. How does the sun work? Well, the sun blasts out particles. It has a huge magnetic field which moves backwards and forwards. And the sun blasts away cosmic radiation. If we let cosmic radiation come in through our defences, it forms low-level clouds. Once we have low-level clouds, we have a reflection back of sunlight. About 60% of energy is reflected back from clouds. So if we've just had an increase of 1% of cloudiness, we can account for all the temperature changes in the 20th century. If we have a very slight change in solar output, 
we can accommodate all of the changes in the 20th century. So the sun looks like a major candidate to drive climate. And we know this because people have been looking at sunspots for hundreds of years. Before sunspots, we can measure carbon-14 and look back 10,000 years. And we see that there are very few sunspots when it's very cold in the Maunder Minimum or the Dalton Minimum. There have been a large number of sunspots when it's warm. We have now gone 203 days without sunspots. And if we listen to what the astronomers are saying, they're saying, oh, yes, well, you know, it's a normal cycle of the sun. We're coming back into another Dalton minimum. So it's the energy pumped out by the sun that blasts away the cosmic radiation. And that tends to get neglected in all of the IPCC and other models. Now, we can see with the upper diagram that the sun is variable. There is what we call a solar constant. But the solar constant is not constant. It varies. And it not only varies in the amount of light, it varies in the amount of ultraviolet energy. And so we can see with our sunspot cycles there, we are about to approach sunspot cycle number 24. 23 was fairly short. 24 looks as if it's going to be long. If we have few sunspots and we've got a long solar cycle, then history has shown us that these are cold times coming. So the sun, for some odd reason, seems to drive climate, and we see it in the past. When people look at stalactites, which are protected from wind, when they're protected from all sorts of exchanges with the air, we can see that there are massive changes in temperature. In the upper diagram there, showing that temperature changes in red, there are massive changes. We also get massive changes in the cosmic radiation. We can correlate these perfectly. So it looks as if on all scales we're driving temperature changes by cosmic radiation. So you can get into the caves, have a good look and say, oh right, we've had a variable sun. And we can again correlate that by looking at clouds and looking at how closely clouds actually correlate with temperature. And again, a very, very good correlation. So there is a relationship between the sun, the clouds and temperature. And that relationship has been known for a very long period of time. Here we've got a measurement of grain prices in Germany. Every time the sun was very active, we got a low grain price. Why? Because we had stable weather. Every time the sun was inactive and our defences weren't up to protect us from cosmic radiation, we had bad weather. And that bad weather gave us high grain prices. This has been known in Germany for a couple of hundred years. It's been known in England for a couple of hundred years. Herschel, the astronomer, used Adam Smith's work on economics to get this relationship. So we've known for a long while that there's a relationship between the sun and weather and climate. And we've got a lot of literature that's giving us this. We hear quite commonly that skeptics don't publish in the scientific literature. Well, I'm sorry, folks. There is a huge literature out up there showing that solar activity drives climate and that just gets conveniently ignored so we're getting a very very selective view of the literature now that selective view is not telling us what we have to do in science and science is a process of where we're using data from all different sources and so just from a very brief view of the literature, we've got just a couple of references. I could get you 500 if you want them. And what this is telling us is that the story we are being given is giving us very, very selective information. Now science is married to evidence. That evidence is from observation, experiment, calculation and measurement. And you argue about how you do that. And then that evidence we have to explain as a scientific theory. And that theory has to be in accord with everything else we know. I'm arguing that a very large amount of knowledge is being ignored in the current story on human-induced climate change. We can go to Ireland and look at rainfall in Dublin and we can tie that into solar cycles because in Ireland we've had an astronomical measuring station for 350 years measuring solar activity and weather. We can go and look at the lake level in Lake Victoria in Africa and again that's tied into solar activity. We can go on the bottom diagram and have a look at river flow. 
and that's tied, the river flow of Africa is tied into a 22-year solar cycle. So we've, we've had this information, and we've had it for more than 100 years, but it just has been selectively ignored in the story we're being told. So this story about driving rainfall, driving river, and changing lake levels, you hear nothing about that, but there's a very big literature on it.